Welcome into Let's Talk Kentucky. We're having fun already. Coming in right out of the gate, laughing, having a good time, dancing. Okay, I feel like we're on day 9,867 of Coach Cow Watch. Uh, we have more Cal Coach Cow news to start out. So he is officially gone, officially, in the search for a new coach is on. So Coach Calipari made the official statement that he was leaving yesterday on X. So this is 15 years, I want to say 15 years of service, like 15 <laughs> years that he's been, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> you still left. He's losing it. <laughs> excuse me, 15 years that he's been with the University of Kentucky. Four, I believe it's four Final Fours mm -hmm. um, and one championship about 50 players who have been sent to the NBA. I mean, he's leaving a legacy. And so he finally, because, you know, they were chasing him down with his dog stroller. <laughs> exactly. Came down in front of his house. So we finally got to hear from him. He said, uh, you know, it's just time for the fans to, to have a new voice. And here's what he said. We've come to realize that this program probably needs to hear another voice, that the university as a whole has to have another voice giving guidance about this program that they hear. And the fans need to hear another voice. We've loved it here, but we think it's time for us to step away and step away completely from the program. And when he says us, he's talking about, of course, him and his wife because mm -hmm. they are a package deal. They are a team. She also made a statement yesterday uh, on her social media, put out a video just kind of sharing her thoughts. And, of course, we also, I feel like everybody in the universe saw them. And mm -hmm. um, what did you all think about the videos? You know, I, the thought that I had was I felt sad. I felt, I felt bad for both of them. Um, but I also agree with Cal for sure and with her, but she was more of how much she appreciated the fans and the community and mm -hmm. everything. But I do agree with Cal that there needs to be another voice and it's time to. I, I thought he handled it very professionally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think with all the rumors and everything crazy that's been going on, I think he handled it very well. Yeah. It was very casual. It wasn't a stiff type of thing. Yeah. It was very mm -hmm. casual and very straight to the point. I so, appreciated that I did point, too. I did, actually. Yes. It was really good. I think it was at, a, at his home. Um, I also appreciated that he didn't allude to anywhere, like where he was going or mm -hmm. any of that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Yes. He kept it local yes. mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. did the thank yous here. So. Absolutely. I, I feel the same way about you guys and um, Ellen Calipari's video. It, it got me a little choked up there toward the end, yeah. the way she was talking about her appreciation for Kentucky and all that has happened here mm -hmm. in her time here. And so I got a little, little choked up with yeah. her and her roommate. Uh, her roommate. I think that that conversation, those videos needed to happen because everybody had their pitchforks out. Like people were like, oh yes. my gosh, I'm mad at him. And after the video, they were like, oh, never mind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. We love you. So um, we're going to talk more uh, with Jeff Pecoro, um on the other side of our break about this. But we have one more story to talk about. There are other things than basketball. Yeah. <laughs> really? really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so here in Lexington, there is an ordinance to stop the sale of cats and dogs at pet shops. And so this piece of legislation, this ordinance has been moving forward. And yesterday it got heard in committee and there were folks on both sides of the issue. So pet stores say that selling the cats and dogs at pet stores keeps them safe from abuse and it's regulated and government watchdogs can come in there and look at them. But one former employee had this to say. The reality is most of the puppies on display come from a puppy mill one of the most depressing and disgusting places on earth. While they may appear healthy, many times these puppies will have diseases. So, yeah, I mean, a former employee saying, mm-mm, Kim, you, you got a look on your face. I, talking about, well, it's regulated. Well, we have all these rules in place. That's once the dogs get there, mm -hmm. is what I'm thinking. It mm -hmm. doesn't tell us. There are so many adoptable pets. You know, from, from the Humane Society, one time I had a friend who, um, uh, there was an accident. They hadn't had their dog fixed yet, and there was a surprise. That's how we adopted the puppy. It wasn't a puppy mill. It was just some friends. You mm -hmm. know, there's the Humane Society. There are so many better ways to do this, and I think keeping them out of the pet stores is the right thing to do. Hmm. I, you know, I have a, a little bit, I have a lot of feels about this. Yes. First of all, I really do. <laughs> and um, I feel like 
if they don't if they don't have the puppies, I feel like they can be better regulated mm -hmm. in the stores versus the puppy mills aren't going to go away. That's still going to happen, unfortunately, and I'm not in support of them in any way, shape or form. But they are still going to exist because people want a certain look of a dog. They want a certain breed. They want this. Sometimes they need it for allergy purposes or whatever the case might be. And the puppy mills are still going to be moving on and they're probably going to be even stronger yeah. because they're going to be the only place that you can get those pets. I feel like they can be better controlled in a pet store and yeah. monitored. And I think that's they probably do need to put some stuff in the ordinance that says uh, puppy mills, selling them out on Craigslist and all of that should be included in this as well. Yes. So I know that's been part of the discussion. Hopefully they will because if not, we'll just just keep having dogs at the flea market just that's getting right. sold. That's well, right. And sometimes, you know, because I have purchased, this was years ago, I did purchase a puppy from a puppy store, um, a pet store, and um, but sometimes you can ask them, you know, where the breeder was and you can do a little bit of a background check before mm -hmm. you purchase the puppy. So maybe if they say this is where we get mm -hmm. the puppies or that wh where was this puppy born and mm -hmm. things like that, it will allow people to do a little bit more research mm -hmm. to see if that's something if that the they want to do. If the stores raise their standards. Yeah. 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 So this will be one to watch. Anytime you're dealing with money, kids or dogs, people are going to go crazy. So I'm very excited to see um, how this one is going to play out. And I hope citizens get involved. So. Yeah, absolutely. All right, everybody, stay with us. Coming up after the break, Jeff Bacoro joins us on the phone to talk about what's next with Coach Cap. All right, so Jeff Bacoro is joining us by phone to talk more about Coach Cal officially leaving. We have questions. He has answers. Hey, Jeff, how are you? <laughs> good morning, guys. How are we today? Good morning. Very good. So you, um, I don't even know, have you even slept? Because <laughs> like, <laughs> I feel like if you, sit, if you sleep... You know, Go ahead. When, when you get when you get old, you sleep fast. You know? <laughs> it's not working so far for me yet. Fast and furious. <laughs> you're not old yet. Because I feel like if you blink, then you're going to miss something. So, all right, Cal's officially gone. What do we know about his next step, him specifically? Well, for him, there is a uh, press conference today. They're ratifying his... Uh, his contract in Arkansas, basically as we speak. And then this afternoon, there is about the 1.30, I think it is, there is going to be a press conference at Bud Walton Arena, and they introduce him as the new head coach. So basically today is the day of, uh, you know, the, the board of trustees gets together and they basically rubber stamp, stamp his contract, and then they, they pull him out. And basically it is a dog and pony show in Arkansas because he will actually – be on stage in a red jacket, and they do a thing called calling the hogs with him. <laughs> <laughs> that's one thing I can't wait to see is him, you know, this guy that's from the East up there going suey, suey. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's oh, for dear. sure. Everyone will tune in for that. Jeff, this is Susan. Um, do we know if the players are going to be going with him? Well, that's the big question now. Because, you know, you, you sign a contract to go to the University of Kentucky, not the University of Calipari, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. Well, so that way, well, you know, the, the coach does have a, a huge impact on where you go. Um, but he'll have, he had exit interviews with all his players, and he'll discuss with them. And we've already seen some of them who've said, you know, I'm going to declare for the draft or I'm going to go in the portal. Um, that's the next big step is how many does he take? From Kentucky, how many? I think the bigger one is how many of the recruits coming in because there's six kids in this freshman class oh. coming in that he had put together. Mm -hmm. How many of those guys go with him? We've already seen one player in Carter Knox who has said, "I'm going to reopen, uh, you know, my recruitment." So um, sure. the dominoes then start to fall. But the quicker Kentucky signs the head coach, and then that whoever the new guy is comes in, he speaks to all the players. And then maybe the players say, you know what, this guy's not too bad. I'm staying here. You Jeff. Um, oh, so that, that's how it works. Jeff, it's Kim here. There, there's a strong rumor that we're going to get Scott Drew or Don Hurley as a new coach. Um, what can you yep. tell us about that? Well, Scott Drew is a guy that has been on Mitch Barnhart's radar for a long time. Uh, he has coached at Baylor. And when he took the Baylor job, they were as bad a team as you could get. They're coming off of probation. They had had all kinds of problems in their program. 
Uh, it wasn't a good situation. He took over, and in just a few years, he turned them into a championship contender. He won a national championship there at Baylor. They're a perennial top 20 team. Um, you know, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Waco, Texas, but, you know, it, it it's in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> hey. And uh, Texas is a big old state. But he's turned that program around and done a fantastic job, and he and he really far are friends. And, and, and Mitch has said for a long time that he's the guy that's on the top of the list. Hey, Jeff, what what does the rebuilding process look like for UK now? Is it, are you know, we got to get back to winning, and so that's where everybody's at. What do you, how do you see that rebuilding process? Well, I think that when you have a situation like this, a new a new coach comes in, whoever it is, it could be, you know, it could be Jeff Bacoro coming in, and what that person is going to do, there's hundreds, literally a thousand players that are in the transfer portal, so you're. Your quick fix is to, as soon as you get there, you have coaches, and all they do is simply sift through this portal and find guys who are in it that fit your needs. The first thing is going to be how many guys stay. Okay, let's see all. Let's say all three of the seven footers leave. Okay, that Kentucky has uh, Big Z, Bradshaw. Uh, you know those guys leave. You gonna then you're going to have to go out there and find a center. If one, two, or all three of those guys come back. Well, then you don't need a big man. Now you got to go out to find guards. So that, that's how it starts. And then he's got to get a recruiting class together very soon. The portal closes on May 1st. So the, the time is of the essence of this. And this is why this will be a quick turnover here at Kentucky. Mm, yeah. Oh, Jeff. Well, thank Ooh. you. You gave us all the tea yeah. that we yeah. needed. Thank you so I much. know that uh, we're going to have team coverage from your sports team throughout the day on this. So we will be looking forward to it, especially that red jacket and calling the hog. So uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Wow. Thank you, Jeff. We will uh, talk Bye, to guys. you later. We appreciate you so much. Have a good day. All right, everybody, stay with us. Coming up after the break, we'll have the countdown convo. We'll ask, is it good to laugh at your pain? Hey, everybody, welcome back to the show. It's time for the Countdown Conversation. This is the part of the show where we discuss things other than Coach Cal in six minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so pain giggles. So there are some researchers that say that laughter can be the best medicine and say that when you're going through a grieving process or a healing journey, that there actually is a time and a season where humor can be appropriate and is sometimes even needed. Uh, Kim, what do you say about this? I've well, you know, I think this is really important. I think it's true. I've been through several bouts of, of pretty serious depression in my life, and being able to laugh at something, whether it be a movie or a funny joke, has meant so much. One of the times I had a difficult time was when my mother passed away. And you've got to be able to, to try to lift out of that because it is a dark time. And I would make jokes, and they weren't always appropriate, unfortunately, but I'd say something like, you know, um, my mom hated this outfit, but she's dead now, and she can't tell me what to do. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I think those of us who have lost a parent can kind of understand yeah. that kind mm -hmm. of humor, yeah. and it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And she would have laughed at that. And she would have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I am in this phase of my life where I laugh a lot to keep from crying. Um, <laughs> From the like the years leading up to my 40s were not as advertised in terms of, of in terms of growing up. It's like oh, once you get to 40, everything will make sense. But I've had all of these really absurd, strange, life-altering things happen to me to the point where I'm like, this this can't really be my life. And I have found that now. I can laugh on the back end of some of them, and sometimes when I'm going through them, I've learned to laugh because I'm like, this is reality TV level stuff. Like, this is, like, this doesn't, ha and you all know, because you hear my stories. Like, this doesn't happen to real people, so I'll just, I'll just learn to laugh. <laughs> Susan, what about you? I went through, uh, I, I would say, like a nightmare. I was living a nightmare for several years, and um, when I got on the other side of it, I noticed that, I don't know if it was like fake it till you make it kind of thing, but I noticed my laugh changing. I don't mm. know if you know what I mean. Like, I had the first belly laugh where it's like I couldn't breathe, tears were rolling <laughs> down my face. You know, Cameron's really good at making me do that. Um, and I noticed, you know what? I feel like I've healed mm. from that. Mm -hmm. It made me appreciate that laughter so much better. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love good. that. I really That's do. Yeah. You know, I, um, I heard somebody recently say that 
we should all protect our inner child. And, and that really stuck with me on several levels, but especially with this topic, because children laugh all the time. They and they're in awe of their surroundings, and, and they, they question everything, and just, you know, they find happiness in the littlest things. Yeah. And, and that's what we kind of need to do when we start feeling that pain start to really overwhelm us, is really try to look for the things around you that really make you happy and surround yourself with that and and just you know and just protect your inner child just be be protective make sure that you want to keep that happiness always inside you no matter how bad things are on the mm -hmm. outside Aww. it's always going there's always going to be a better day yeah. i think yeah yeah very good if all else fails watch a comedy you know yeah. do right. something to make yourself <laughs> yeah laugh. exactly Great point. yeah Okay, up next, no gift. So parents are doing this thing where they're saying, we're having a birthday party for little Johnny, but he's not getting any gifts. And this <laughs> trend is picking up. So what do y'all think, Lisa? What would happen if you told your kids, uh-uh, no gifts this year? I, my, my youngest would absolutely, he would look at me like I had 10 heads. He'd be like, are you crazy? Are you crazy? And, and uh, you know, and I think of my oldest, and he would be like, you know, okay, okay. So what are you and dad gonna go ahead and get me that one. Is it going to be the, you know, four-pack DVD set for, of trains that I want? And yeah. I'm like, no, it means that there's no gifts, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So I don't know. I, I think my kids would actually think that I've lost my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I actually kind of think this is a good idea. We have so much stuff, and kids have a lot of things. I've seen some parents have parties where it's no gifts for my child, for little Johnny, but bring something for this charity that we're going to be donating to, which I think is a great idea. And that can be an optional thing too. I remember when I was little, there's so many birthday parties and we didn't have a lot of money and it was so embarrassing to buy a piece of junk basically that I thought to give to someone that I liked and, and loved and it was just so hard. So I think no gifts can be beneficial to parents who just don't have a lot of money. Mm, that's good. Yeah. And I think it all depends on the age too of, mm. of the child. Um, but I think, you know, I'm all about getting Alex like a special gift, you know, or going someplace mm -hmm. for that. But I tell you what, Pinterest has ruined it for me. <laughs> yes, because yes. it has set the standard so high. I have gone to birthday parties where we are leaving with a gift. Yeah, You know, it's like the party favors have just, I'm like, there's no way I can live up to these expectations. <laughs> I'm going to fail every single time. And you were talking about animals and stuff. Oh, petting zoos. I've, I've been to one-year-old birthday parties with petting zoos. And that kid could care less. He <laughs> to play with the wrapping paper. Exactly. You know? <laughs> I think petting zoos are always dangerous because somebody's going to put their finger in the mouth of like the llama <laughs> and then you know, then yeah. you got a liability case. It's like, let's just, <laughs> let's just keep the animals out of it if we can. So I, <laughs> so I am big on birthdays. I'm the birthday czar here at uh, oh, yeah. ABC 36. I try to make sure that everybody is celebrated. And if you're like Kim and you try not to tell us your birthday, then we will gang up on you the day after and you will be celebrated. So I'm big on birthdays. <laughs> I think you all are making great points that we take it too far when we make the day of someone's birth all about the material things. It's really about being blessed to see another year and about what you're looking forward to and looking back on the things that you've overcome. Now, this is as we get old. When they're kids, they're just like, I want pizza and Ninja Turtles. But I think everybody should get a gift because it's a celebration. But I think like Susan said, when it gets too material, when it gets too out of hand, when it mm -hmm. becomes a competition, when you're making people feel like they're less than because of status Ooh. symbols, like Kim talked about, yeah. it's going too far. That's so right. uh, we'll see. Uh, but Lisa <laughs> knows for sure it's a no. <laughs> it's a no. <laughs> All right, everybody, stay with us coming up after the break. A five-year-old boy saves his family from a fire, and we highlight the woman we're talking about. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Let's Talk in Tucky. So this next story is going to make you smile. A five-year-old boy is being called a hero after alerting his family to a fire in their home. This is him. Look at this little fella. Aww. So... Last Friday, Juwan Perry Jr. woke up to the smell of smoke in his Michigan home. And when he saw flames, he just started calling mom, mom, 
mom, the house is on fire. <laughs> and the mom was able to get up and get all of his brothers and sisters, seven of them total outside to safety. Their mom says if it wasn't for him, they would not have survived. Now, Aww. the fire was put out, but they've lost their entire home, but everybody is okay because of that little cutie. Oh, look at that. Goodness. Well done. I know. And he probably just went downstairs to start, you know, click on the TV and watch some cartoons. <laughs> and little did he know he was going to come across a fire in mm -hmm. his house. Exactly. That they could be so terrifying for a five-year-old. I could exactly. totally, I, would, yeah. I might freeze. I might not know what to do. Right. Mm -hmm. Might That's go back to bed. I mean, you might hide from it. Exactly. You know? That's a mom's worst nightmare, though. Let me tell you, yes, because you need is. to know, like, I'll lay in bed sometimes at night and like, okay, where's Alex? How would I get to him? If I couldn't get That's to right. him, where would he go? Uh, yeah. You know, but yeah. good for that little boy. I know. He had I the know. presence of mind. And I think this is a good reminder. Susie, you raise a really great point. This is a reminder for anybody watching to have a conversation with your kiddos mm -hmm. or grandkids or nieces and nephews about what to do if there is a fire. Absolutely. You know, don't yes. get scared. Wake us up. Yes. Holla, say something. Mm -hmm. yes. So yes. kudos to that little fella. Okay, we like to end every show by highlighting a woman we're talking about. Today's woman is Amber Martin. And we are highlighting her as a part of Autism Acceptance Month. She is an autism advocate here in Lexington. Mm -hmm. She is a mother of three. One of her children has autism and she does lots in her community. She sits on the board of the Explorium in Lexington and works to raise awareness about autism in children. And she was nominated by Susan. She's Yay. an amazing person. Her husband, Ryan, um, um, they live here. They're huge advocates for their son and others with autism. And uh, she, she, she's a Disney planner. So even Ooh. if, like, if you have a child on the spectrum, like, you can reach out to her and ask oh, her questions yeah. about oh, Disney. Mm -hmm. So it's really cool. But yes. Amber, I love you. I love Aww. you. Congratulations. Yay. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We hope you have a good day. As good as Coach Cal. <laughs> <laughs>